I bought a boat recently because, well, it was for sale. What's going on, YouTube? There is a Gamescom interview that I've been asked to react to because everybody is talking about it. So I wanted to give my takes as well as kind of dispel some of the rumors that are in there. Uh, because one of the more popular questions is, are you going to be removing support for the original Xboxes and PlayStations? So right away, the answer is pretty much no. We'll look at the specific questions, though, because they address things from furniture bags, armory bags, to companions, to the newest updates, to how long of a roadmap they have for the Elder Scrolls Online. So we're going to break down the entire interview as well as the questions and answers, and I'll give my two cents, but I really just want to provide the information as it was asked, that way people don't speculate as to where we're going and how things are going to be looking because don't worry there's not removing support for the original consoles anytime soon and this was posted september 5th and it was done at gamescom this year and this was done with rich lambert the game director for the elder scrolls online we're going to skip the top part of the description because it just gives a bit of a brief on the gold road update we kind of know that information as well as this being the 10-year anniversary also, this will be linked in the description below, so anything that you wish to read here, you can read the whole thing. I won't be offended if you don't want to listen to my voice. It's great information. And the first couple questions are about the celebration events. The first one being basically, are you going to be continuing to do them in person? Where will they be? And we know one's going to be in Milan, San Diego, as well as PAX Australia, uh, which is going to be really cool. They also talk about the in-person event that happened because they asked, cool, overall, how's the 10-year anniversary been going so far? And um, Rich notes that it's been amazing. The players, the community have gone to these events have really been enjoying themselves. They get to see the developers. They get to see their friends. In Amsterdam, they had a group of podcasters that had been doing podcasts together for almost 10 years, and they had never met in person because one lives in Turkey, one lives in the U.S., and that was the first time that they had ever met each other face-to-face -face was at their Amsterdam event, which is actually just exceptionally awesome. I don't know specifically which podcast that was, but there were tons of people who had never met each other it got to meet each other at that event. I was able to talk to people like T.C. Lee, Deltia, Skinny Cheeks. You know, there were so many cool content creators that I was able to have com just conversations with that I'd never spoken to before, which was an awesome thing. And I imagine this is some kind of awesome opportunity to get feedback from the fans. And he said, yes, 100%. We sit down, we talk to them. Actually, at the Tavern, which was in July this year, I had a number of people come up to me with thick books with just notes of things. Some of them were poems and pictures and stuff like that, but others were, hey, we pulled our guild. Here are some things that we would love to see added or changed in the Elder Scrolls Online, which is really cool. And I want to echo this mentality, too, because I have been on a few developers' panels at this point. I've been able to pick their brains one-on-one. -on -one. Anytime I suggest something or I say, hey, I think this would be a really cool addition, they never outright say, you know, we can't do that. They may say, you know, this is something that may be difficult based on the time that it was coded. You know, we would want to make sure that if we did something that major that enough players would interact with it. They give answers that are not dismissive. And so I had actually been going to Greyhost recently and asking people what changes they would like to see in Cyrodiil. Because I plan to see if I can ask and say, hey, what do you guys think about implementing some of these changes into Cyrodiil? And the number one thing that we came up with was maybe there could just Battle Spirit could give you a mount speed increase. You know, so even just small changes to things like Cyrodiil that people don't normally think of, because I didn't think of it. I'm in Cyrodiil every day, and I'm like, man, how could we make this a little bit more fun? One of you guys came up with that suggestion, and it is fantastic, in my opinion. The next questions are regarding the zone itself, as well as the Gold Road chapter. You released the Gold Road chapter. What was the reception like compared to last year? He said it's been really positive. Players have really reacted well to the zone. It's a foresty type of area, but it's not greens and browns. It's bright colors, interesting environments. They love Athalia, the new Daedric Prince recreated. They absolutely love her. Since it was a different type of story from the ones you've done before in the game, what did you do differently? Were there some challenges? I think the biggest challenge is that we were writing a brand new Daedric Prince. Yeah, you would think that that would be something that could be pretty difficult to you know, iron out. And that's never been done before. Figuring how to make her stand on her own and not feel the same as the other ones was a big challenge for us. I was thinking that too when they added a new Daedric Prince. How are they going to make them different than all the other ones? Because they say, you know, what are the traits? Because a lot of Daedric Princes cover a lot of traits. When we were started going in and thinking about, well, Hermaeus Mora is all about order and keeping everything in line and knowing everything. We started bouncing in on what's the antithesis of that. 
that's where we got into this chaos of the, the threads of fade and bouncing around. And so that was the really fun project to figure out. Once we got that, it helped inform some of the stories and where we were going to kind of go from there, which I think is a great way to kind of look at it and kind of create a storyboard idea. And this question's funny. When you came up with the idea of Athalia, was Bethesda Game Studios already on board or did it take some convincing? It took a little negotiating. It's something new, right? And it's never been done before, but that's kind of how we work, frankly. We pitch ideas, we talk, we work things out. Uh, Dragons was a really good example, too. They didn't want us to do Dragons initially at launch because they weren't in our timeline. At least there was no recorded history in our timeline of Dragons. And then we worked through, what if we did this? The players were the source of this, so at the end we were like, that's cool, it can work. And he said, you just released Update 43, dedicated to housing. And he says, on Monday, yeah, travel day to Gamescom, the teams back at home were hard at work at launching Update 43. The big system that we added was home tours, which allowed players to easily share their homes with other players so they could see what they've created. Our housing system is very unique to other games because you can basically phase chairs into ceilings sofas and things together you can be pretty liberal with how you want to kind of connect all your objects together and now you can share it and go right there and, and look at other people's creations next is regarding the furnishing bag on a side note here's a question from the community they'd like to get a furnishing bag and he says yes we've heard that a lot it's something that we've been looking into for a while it's not as easy to do as the crafting bag because of the crafting bag and how databases is set up it's very cheap I guess it's easiest way to say or less intensive to implement a number in a row in a database versus it is to add more rows. With the crafting bag, there's a small number of items with that stack nearly indefinitely, but with a furnishing bag, it's a large number of items that don't stack. We're working through how to do that without destroying the servers and databases because it's really expensive. We have millions of players all have housing objects, so it adds up very quickly. And I think this is a fair point because if you think of all the items that fit inside a crafting bag, they all stack together. If you were to even add just the base game furniture from there that you could literally only get if you had none of the DLCs purchased or none of the additional plans, there's a lot of furniture. And it doesn't all stack in the same way as well. So I think that's been the biggest thing uh, that's been an obstacle. But they also talk about an armory bag, which I didn't even know was something that they had been going back and forth on. And so they ask, what about an armory bag? An armory bag, we've talked a lot about when we did the armory system. We went back and forth on whether we could just pull stuff out of your bank or not. And there were actually a lot of scenarios where players could break the game. For instance, what if your inventory is full and you're pulling stuff out of your bank or into your bank? What if the bank is full? What if there's lag? What happens if two items get duplicated? There's lots and lots of issues with doing that. What we decided was we're just not going to give the players more inventory before their item sets and instead go the route of what we did with the stable, where you could still collect them all and get them out of your inventory, but not easily be able to swap back and forth in your bank. So basically, we have the sticker book, we have the armory system now. Uh, it sounds like they were tweaking and considering, you know, letting us pull sets and stuff straight from the bank, but there was problems with duplicating, and, and there was big system issues with kind of compiling that data. With the Gold Road, you added Scribing, a precursor to spellcrafting, to the Elder Scrolls Online. How are you planning to build upon this new system in the future? Actually, in Update 43, we just added some more scripts, which allow players to do more things with them. We added some frost-based scripts, so as you can have frost magic, if that's what you're really into. Now there's 5,500 combinations, or just over that number. So there's lots of opportunities to mix and match. And if players continue to play and enjoy the system, we're going to continue to support it. I think that this is basically the same thing as scrying. It was added in Graymore. Graymore, every single year, there's been new antiquities added. I don't know why they're being so coy with this. Like, we know that you're going to continue to update this system. You just added more in Update 44. Um, but a, a lot of people obviously do really enjoy the scribing system. And I hope that it kind of becomes a little bit more balanced with cross healing for PvP, but I overall think it's still a net positive. And they also note too that styling had a bunch as well added because they asked, does that include the styling updates as well? So there'll be new styling coming out in update 43 and update 44 and likely in every single major update that we receive for the near future. Another fascinating question. What about new sorcerer pet models or skins? We've had a lot of feedback on this ever since we did the Warden and the Bearskin for that. For Sorcerer Pets, it's not something that we, we don't want to do. it. It's more of a how do we do it without blowing up the game because there's a lot of performance issues with that, but we've been absolutely been looking at that. 
Hot take, I think that they buffed the sorcerers not using their pets in Cyrodiil so the Cyrodiil runs more efficiently. It's a conspiracy theory that I have that I wholeheartedly believe in. I do think that it would be cool to have sorcerer pet models. Like, don't get me wrong, I play a sorcerer, but I do think that it probably does add a lot of performance issues to the game. The next question I thought was interesting. Will companions ever be able to wear helmets in the future? We made the decision early on that we wanted the companions to always have visible faces because it's their personality. They have unique faces. They do go back and forth, but it was their original intent to have their faces shown. That way you can still identify them. Players can customize their abilities and other such things, though, but they always wanted the companions' initial personalities to kind of shine through. I think it's interesting. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on companions being able to wear helmets, but it's interesting that they did put this much thought into companions. I almost, originally, I was thinking that they wanted companions to be kind of used in like a 2v2, like, dueling system originally, and that's why they didn't let them wear helmets. That way, if you were fighting somebody, you could recognize the companion that you're fighting, but I don't know if that's ever something that they're going to add, but it was something that I thought that they may add in the future when they update the dueling system. The next question is about companion gear. What about the companions using player gear? He says, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to dig into that war. Companion gear is different from player gear. We did that again for performance reasons. The player items are very, very expensive on the database and all the companion items are not. So whether or not they could actually wear player gear in the future is something we would have to talk about. I don't know if anybody's actually asking to be able to put player gear on companions. I'm sure there are some people who think it would be cool, but I definitely think that that could become its whole hassle, you know, trying to build out and then, you know, trying to get your Bastion to proc his Kinraz because he's not light attacking could be a whole other ordeal and reason to yell at him. And then recently, they asked, you introduced curation for the Undaunted. What about curating other stuff like motif pages that drop from City Daily Quests? Which is interesting. And he said, we're slowly going through and looking at those pain points. We did the Undaunted this past update. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but we also did some Imperial City curation, which they did actually announce yesterday. And they've also added curated drops to weekly trial rewards, and they're constantly looking at you know, what makes sense. I think from the curation perspective, the developers are not going to look at it from a motif perspective. I think they're only going to look at it from a set perspective. I think that that's going to be their main focus, except for obviously the stuff like the outfit style pages that are bound to you. And if you get duplicates of them, you can't do anything. Obviously, they're not going to like put, you know, the previous bags of glory. You're not going to get duplicates of those. So those are going to be curated. But any motif style furnishing plan, I don't think that those are ever going to become curated, but it was certainly an interesting question. And it's interesting to see if they do continue to expand that system. The next question is an interesting one. Can you make mount upgrades work for all characters? And he says, we get that feedback a lot. And the answer is not easily. And then they ask, could you ramp up the speed for which old styles are made available again? He says, I can talk to the group that manages that. There's a kind of balance in that. If you do it too much and too often, the players get overwhelmed, so you have to be careful. I definitely think that that's true, especially when you look at the value of what the Opal pages were worth like five years ago versus now. You know, their, their value is essentially plummeted. Uh, same with even a lot of the rarer um, Eben styles, a lot of the Midger Mayhem styles that used to have a lot of value, their value kind of goes down. I don't know if that's the styles that they're necessarily referring to, but I think that there definitely needs to be a balance in that. And then we get one of the big questions. Can you increase the total furnishings in the house? And he says, we get that a lot too. And there are limits in place for performance. We don't want to ever happen is a player puts something in their home and then they crash and can never get back in there. That's why these limits exist. And I will say, when I had a, a Princely Dawnlight Palace, 700 out of 700, I had a friend who could not load into, into my house at all. And that's a pretty scary thought. If, you, if that's your own home, then what do you do? You can't go and get all those furnishings. You know, it can mess up, you know, a whole bunch of things. So, you know, they, get, they say that's why these limits exist, but they're looking at ways to improve and increase how they can do that but they're there for a reason we don't want ever players to be in a situation where they can't access their own home which is a very valid point i think some of the changes like having all of the to tables used for crafting kind of merged into one the attunables was a great way forward where people don't need as many furnishings in their house too i think that also will help because i'm sure those are also more difficult to load in because they're all programmable you know independently to be a specific set 
So I think that was one of the changes that will probably help with this in the future because I personally would love to see more furnishings being able to be placed in a house. And here's one of the big ones. Speaking of performance, will you still support PlayStation 4 and Xbox One? There are already whispers of a generational console that's going to follow the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and X. So the question is, is how long do you plan to support them for ESO? Will you maybe drop them at some point? And he says, as long as players are playing on them, it doesn't make sense to remove them. We have shown in the past that we will do whatever makes sense. With Windows 7, we supported it for a very, very long time. When it came to end of life, Microsoft stopped supporting it. And then there were as fewer and fewer players actually on it. That's when they dropped it. The follow up to that is, so do you still see a lot of players playing on PS4 and Xbox One? He said there's a tons of players on there and back as well. That's another question that we get asked of why we support Mac. And he says because there's a lot of players that play on there. We don't ever want to take that away if we can. Fascinating note too is that when I played Ark Survival Evolved a lot, a lot of my uh, EU or South American tribe mates, they're still playing on the original PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It was very hard, and it still is very hard to get those consoles. And if they were all being forced to upgrade, that would probably be a very big strain on a lot of people. And we probably would see a drop off in the player base. And that seems like they are really concerned on making sure that anybody who wants to play ESO, regardless of the hardware they have, they're still able to continue to play it. The next question is about, did you get an influx of new players when ESO launched on GeForce Now? And somebody is going to have to tell me what GeForce Now is, but he says, absolutely. And he says, I asked you in a previous interview, but are there any talks about Microsoft adding the game to Game Pass? He says, it's on Game Pass for consoles, but not for PC. And that there are various technical reasons why it's not there, but it's something that they continue to look at and see if that's something that they're going to add in the future. He says, I know you completed the hardware upgrade a while ago, but are you still looking at ways to improve the server performance beyond that? And he says, yes, the hardware update helped, and for the most part, things are pretty stable and solid. However, there are still periods during peak hours where it's not as good as we want, so we're definitely looking at ways to further improve that. I will say that too. If I go to Cyrodiil and it's not off hours, I feel crisp. My executes, everything is firing off beautifully. If I'm at peak hours, sometimes it still turns into a bit of a lag fest on occasion. And then he asks, what will the primary focus of Update 44 be? Which we already know is Battlegrounds related as well as some other things such as new companions, changes to Telvar, new rotating Telvar merchant, you know, golden curiosity challenges, all sorts of other things. You know, I'm still waiting to see what these golden pursuits are actually going to be. Uh, but there was quite a few things in there. And But the next question is about the Alliance War, which is a great question. And he says, what about Alliance War? Are you doing anything about that? And he says, that's where we have to start looking at performance. And then we also have to look at some quality of life, such as item curation. And then we're constantly adding new cosmetics that you can earn through PVP, adding new item sets and rewards for the worthy. So they are adding new uh, sets for rewards of the worthy. They're also adding new outfit pages. I don't know if they're also adding new achievements. I believe that they use the word achievements in their live stream. I would love to see more achievements get added. I also think to our suggestion of a 10% mount or even a 20% mount speed while Battle Spirit is active would solve a lot of Cyrodiil problems. But we'll definitely have to kind of see uh, what kind of comes of everything and how everything looks on PTS on Monday because we only got really an overview of what Update 44 is going to be. Then there's this question. I know this is a question you get asked frequently, but do you have any thoughts on crossplay? Is it even doable? And he says, it's never been a no, it's always been a holy hell. We made many decisions in 2007. That's crazy to think that that's when conceptually they made these decisions. 2007. And they're very difficult to change. And then we'd have to get all the parties together to make sure that we're good and how we're going to go about implementing it's a huge technical challenge to solve do i think that we will get there in the future maybe i think that's where technology is just going in general people just want to be together and make it easy to remove all the friction to play together but like i said we started building this game in 2007 when that wasn't even remotely a thought in anybody's head back then so i do think that there is a possibility that eso will become cross playable I think that by the time that the Elder Scrolls reaches its final peak, I think that it will have crossplay. But I think it's definitely going to be a lot of technical challenges. But as hardware continues to improve, 
as you know, processing power continues to improve, I think we will get to a point where it is feasible. There's just going to have to be a lot of changes. Like they're going to have to like quadruple the amount of guild traders and you know give everybody on console a bit of a wealth boost you know, <laughs> to catch up to PC players. It, there would be a lot of challenges that go along with crossplay, um, but I, it is exciting to hear that the answer is not no. It's that you know maybe in the future. And finally, they ask, on that note, ESO has turned 10. How long do you have a roadmap for internally? He says, game development, there's a fuzziness to that, right? We have a five-year plan of where we want to go, and then we've got a more specified three-year plan, and then we have an 18-month locked-in roadmap. We're constantly iterating and updating that just because we have a five-year plan doesn't mean we're going to stop after five years. It's just that's as far ahead as we have the brain power to think at least right now, but as long as people want to continue to play ESO, we're going to continue to support ESO. And I think realistically with how popular ESO has been on the console market, how popular it is in the total MMO charts, I think that it's going to continue to receive support after five years. I think even when the Elder Scrolls you know, 6 does release, it will only kind of embolden more people to explore the Elder Scrolls universe. Because speaking from my own personal perspective, I was never an MMO person. I enjoyed Skyrim so much that after I played it, I saw that ESO had a beta that came out and I said, you can explore all the other zones because I went back to Oblivion and was exploring the Cyrodiil zone. I said, I want to play ESO just to see all these other zones, to see the quests that go on there, to like get inundated with the lore just because of all of the things that it kind of provided at that time. And I think that when Elder Scrolls 6 comes out, it's just going to kind of continue to further you know, bringing people back into the kind of the MMO-ness of The Elder Scrolls Online. But everyone, that is where I leave you. It's a bit of a longer video because we're reading through an entire article that had lots of good questions. And I will be at the San Diego event that occurs next weekend. So if you guys have questions or suggestions, I do want to try to make a list of ideas for Cyrodiil. Some of the ones that you guys had been suggesting was obviously that mount speed. Some of you had also suggested additional roles besides the Emperor. Maybe when somebody becomes the Emperor, second and third place become a different role, like a general or a war, somebody that also gets buffs around them. Or somebody had mentioned, too, that the, whatever team is in last place, whoever their top leaderboard person is, becomes like a rebellion leader that also gets buffs and things that gives them bonuses to taking keeps or giving siege weapon buffs that way that they can kind of catch up quicker. You guys had tons of ideas, and I want you to use this comment section below and use Discord and send me those ideas because I do want to continue to make a list because I've been writing them out, and I do want to try to see if we can get an idea of when Cyrodiil will have its update as well as what ideas they are trying and kind of, you know, just throwing out, like, what are some ideas that conceptually they're thinking about for Cyrodiil when they do uh, inevitably update it. But everyone, thank you guys again for watching. And as always, we're doing our three giveaway drawings. All you need to do is leave a comment in the comments below. If you want to tell me what suggestions or changes you would make to Cyrodiil, put them in the comments below. If not, you can ask anything else or tell me anything else. Second thing is just make sure you're subscribed slash following on Twitch and Twitter. And the third thing is look for a hidden word to be flashed upon the screen. If you're the first person to comment that word, you will win. Thank you guys so much again for watching, and I'll catch you later. Bye, guys. You better remember to like and subscribe to Jake Clips. Or you should. I might have to pluck your eyes if you don't. Or, better yet, I'll skip rope with your entrails. Do it now. Subscribe. Ta-ta. Off with you.